Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. Warning. The Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. November 17th, 2017. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, Winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. Welcome back to the Savage Nation. If you missed hour one, you're late for class. Ask one of the other uh, students to uh, share the Savage notes with you, because I'm not going to review what I did. But I want to move on from the killing of the big game and how Trump should not reverse the Obama order on this, to uh, the difference between killing and murdering, because there's a great confusion in those of you who are listening to me, where you may think I'm a pacifist. You're wrong. I'm not a pacifist. I'm a man who hates violence and who would rather avoid confrontation if I could and avoid war. But don't confuse me with a pacifist. There's a fabulous article on this by Ra Rabbi David Bendori, director of a group called Jews for the Preservation of Firearms Ownership. It's a fabulous article, and I'm going to quote a little bit from it, where he says, The Ten Commandments, Killing and Murder, a detailed commentary. Jews for the Preservation of Firearms Ownership. And he says, This is a detailed commentary intended to give valuable reference to Jews and Christians who find themselves facing unfounded pacifist dogma. So let's begin, and I'm going to paraphrase and, tra and, and actually quote, one of the most commonly mistranslated verses of all the Hebrew scriptures, which has resulted in deadly misinterpretation, according to the rabbi, is where the Torah, Exodus 20, says, Lo tizach, the Hebrew word used as a clear meaning, do not murder. It doesn't mean do not kill. I learned this a long time ago because I was, conf I was confronting a holy writer on this, where it says, if thou, thou shalt not kill, how can you then go to war against those who want to slay you? Because there's a big difference between thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not murder. Unfortunately, many of us have mistranslated the Bible as meaning do not kill. But he says the Hebrew could not be more clear, and there is a world of difference between killing and murder. How many times have you heard, thou shalt not kill? It's a mistranslation. It's etched into the hearts and minds of both Jewish and Christian children and adults with pernicious results, says the rabbi. And he asks, can we possibly estimate the numbers of lives that have been lost by foolish pacifism rather than righteous defense in the face of evil? You can read the article yourself. And he goes into killing and murdering. And we're going to talk about that maybe another time. And I don't want to give you what he wrote. You can read it for yourself. The point is, is that if you're out to defend yourself, you're not murdering anybody. You're killing somebody, Right. What's the difference between killing and murdering? What if a driver accidentally hits a jaywalking pedestrian? That's a little different. What about a soldier who kills an enemy in battle? What about a drug dealer who kills his competition? What about a doctor who kills his patient? Well, I'll let you think about that. In order for you to understand the biblical words for killing, you have to first understand a grammatical point. Hebrew words all contain three-letter roots that provide the core meaning of a word. And these three consonants are then vocalized by adding in vowels and attaching prefixes, suffixes, or infixes. You can read more about it on the rabbi's page, which I'll link up on michaelsavage.com. The point is, don't fall into the pacifist trap. Because it's a big difference. Thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not murder. And that brings us to something I want to talk about, which is how sensitive do you want to be? I wrote about it in one page in God, Faith, and Reason. I think it's worth buying the book just for the two pages on dominion and sensitivity. And I'm going to read you one page from God, Faith, and Reason because I do want you to buy the book before Sunday. How sensitive do you want to be? There's a trend in America and the West now where people are overly sensitive to the living things around them. We all know about vegan diets. People think it's healthier. Now, this is not a book about nutrition, so I won't get into that.
But I do want to talk about people becoming so sensitive to animal life that they refuse to eat animals or animal products. I understand that. It would be hard to find many people who would not become vegetarians or vegans after visiting a slaughterhouse or watching a film of what happens inside a slaughterhouse, seeing the fear in the animal's eyes and hearing their cries as they're killed. I understand the sympathy people have for them. But there are also people who say that they can hear the trees crying in a newly built home or a newly built cabin. Did you know that? I remember reading about this in a story by a rabbi of the Orthodox Jewish tradition, Chabad, written sometime in the 17th century in Russia or Poland. One of the sages wrote, wrote that when he went into a newly built cabin, he could hear the trees the cabin was made of crying. There's another story about the son of one of the great sages that took a leaf of a tree as he was walking in the forest with his father. And the father admonished the boy by saying, how can you be so insensitive to ruin something that is so alive for no reason whatsoever? So how sensitive do you want to be is the question. How tuned in do you want to be to the voices that travel around the world that no one can hear except the very few, the mad and the enlightened? And what are the voices that we're talking about? They can be anything. They can be the voices of people crying out as they die. They can be the voices of spirits, things of that nature. How sensitive do you want to be is always the question. In my own life, I do not think it's that important to tune in to such an extent that you lose the scope of the world in which we are living. The here and now, the world where our feet are planted on the ground. This earth is the only heaven for so many billions of people, and we must learn to live in this heaven God has created. Sure, there may be an afterlife, but we don't know that for sure. The only world we have direct knowledge of is this world, which we must not mess up. So how sensitive you want to be becomes not so much a question as a statement. Being insensitive makes you oafish, but being overly sensitive can render you incapable of living on this earth. And that's my revelation for the day. You can read it for yourself in God, faith, and reason. Share it with others. And when I talk about how sensitive you want to be, I'm reminded of another religion on earth. There are people in India who are called Jains, J-A-I-N-S. They are so sensitive to all living things that they walk around with a net in front of their, that they carry with them like a waving net made of uh, cloth that wave in front of their nose and their mouth as they walk the streets of India in order to not inhale the invisible living things in the air. Would you believe that? That people have gotten that far into this whole concept of sensitivity to the living thing? The world is a huge place. The diversity of religions, the diversity of ideas is, to use a pat, a pat phrase, mind-boggling. And remember, I'm a former anthropologist where I studied physical anthropology more than social anthropology for years and years and in those years of searching the world for healing plants I searched for many other things and that is something I came upon in my travels and my reading so I, I incorporate all of it in the book God Faith and Reason it all comes together in that one little book and I can bring it back to elephants if you want or or, or things like that and the big game hunters who I think are psychopaths but I want to go to a caller, if I can, and you're invited to call on these topics of murdering, killing, killing the animals, 855-407-282. I realize that this is not the normal fare for talk radio. I get it. I'm not apologizing because I'm not the normal guy. I mean, I never have been and never will be. God bless those who do what they do. I'm not here to knock anyone else. And the point is, is that this is what I do. This is what I want to do. This is how I want to do it. It's really not different from what I've been doing for 24 years on the radio. I've always been an animal rights activist. I've always wanted to tell you about a con that it's con that a conservationist is the natural thing for a conservative to be, not a land killer. You understand that? I've been saying the same things in different ways for 24 years. So it's nothing new. I'm not going into a new direction. I'm just going to do more of what I've been doing and less of the other stuff. That's where I'm going in 2018. God willing, I'm on the radio. Healthy. I'm going to be doing that. You're going to hear more of this rather than less of it. Call it what you will. I'm not going to do Republican, Democrat, Democrat, Republican. He said this, she said that. They did this, they did that. You can get it. Oh, you want to listen to it, go ahead. It's nothing. I, I didn't evolve to this point with millions of years of evolution to devolve to the point of talking about Democrats and Republicans. Believe me, there's more in the world than politicians, right, and political points of view. 
So, we'll talk about all the other stuff. I actually may do seminars. I've been thinking about that. But it's not the time to talk about that because, uh, well, no, no, not now, Michael. Don't go down that road. I don't want to talk about it. There'll be very small groups, top 20 people in a closed setting where no one knows where it's going to be held. It'll be done by email once you sign up so that I don't get people bothering me. And it's going to be a closed, like, guru-like seminar, me and 20 people. Wouldn't you like that? I think that'd be fun. I'll be Guru Mike in 2018, off the radio. And um, I'll get to meet some of the listeners. They'll get to meet me. I know many of you say, oh, I want to go. I don't know. I'm not ready to talk about it. Let's wait for that. Let's talk about what we're talking about. Let's go to a psychologist on the killing of animals. Gary on WFNC in North Carolina. We have a limited amount of time. Gary, start the conversation, please. Yeah, Dr. Savage, thank you for uh, this opportunity. Um, I, I applaud your message today. Um, I've been a developmental psychologist for uh, about 33 years now. I worked in the schools for a number of years with kids who have uh, conduct disorders, um, especially. And uh, one of the hallmarks of conduct disorders, you may know, is cruelty to animals and lack of. Oh empathy. yes, yeah. Oh, I want you to go on. I'm not going to interrupt you, Gary. You just gotten started. When I was a kid, there were always there was always one in the crowd who tortured animals, and the rest of us would stop him. There was always a kid who was sick, the and kind they, of kid who would, who would tie cans to a cat's tail to see the cat running down the street. I've seen it in the Bronx. Tell us about that kind of mentally disturbed child as quickly, and then I'm going to take a break and come back to you, please. Well, kid, kids who lack empathy are basically they're, they're self-centered. They grow up that way. They continue that way. They're exploitative. They show little remorse. Um, and one of the hallmarks of, uh, that was just added to the DSM-5, the most recent uh, iteration of the DSM system, is the callous and emotional state. And um, that's what we're seeing with uh, the hunters that just go out and just kill for the sake of killing. Well, I, I agree with you that the hunters of uh, the elephants and of the lions, especially those who go to a, um, an animal farm in Texas where the lions are bred to be shot, they are psychopaths. And they're cowards on top of it all. Well, we'll come back in a minute. Gary, I, mean, I must ask you more about the psychology of children who are this callous. I want to know more about it and if they can be helped in any way right here on the Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. Eventually, this conversation, when it starts with the elephants, is going to lead us back to capital punishment. And I will show you that the Bible supports capital punishment. Uh, when I say Genesis 9, 6 says, If the blood of one man is spilled by another, his blood shall be spilled. Clear reference to murdering. Murdering. I didn't say torture, but murder. Although in some cases, I would say torture might be justified for some of the things that people do to other people. But that's not a call for me to make right now. And while murder, which the rabbi says is killing with criminal intent and malice, is prohibited at all times and in all circumstances, murder is, killing itself is not. Moses killed an Egyptian taskmaster who was beating an innocent Hebrew slave. In Hebrew scripture we read, God himself kills in punishment many times. Noah's generation, the people of Sodom and the Egyptian firstborn are a few exceptions. Examples. And what is the court? The courts in America. What do the courts in America do? The courts are commanded to take the life of the convicted murderer as punishment. And according to the rabbi, we are even told that the killing to prevent a rape is permissible. Deuteron Deuteronomy twenty two twenty six. So, my friends, thou shalt not murder is the sixth commandment. It's not thou shalt not kill. But let's go back to psychologist Gary in North Carolina. Gary, can these kids without compassion be, be in any way helped, or are they born that way? Well, usually um, everyone, I believe, um, is, is born with um, the capacity for empathy. Um, but um, when they're, you know, one of the major types of uh, disorder that is usually the most intractable or unchangeable uh, to a certain degree is the early onset type. 
And uh, that usually has a worse prognosis and usually has uh, a greater probability of them engaging in criminal behavior. Gary, aren't there some children who are just born bad for whatever the reasons are? I mean, well, whether it's genetics or the mother was on drugs or the father was on drugs or they were just born bad. Aren't there just people who are born bad? I believe that you can definitely have a predisposition toward being mean. Yes. Mm. Well, that says it all. Some people yeah. are incurably evil and mad and bad. Gary, thanks for joining us. I'm sending you God, faith, and reason for the holidays. I hope you'll find it in some ways interesting. That's all. What else can I say? Let's go to WABC New York. John, John, get it off your chest. What's on your mind, John? Well, I was, um, you know, I have tears in my eyes telling your producer this story. Um, when I was a young boy, my father was an avid hunter, and I never liked hunting. You know, I never told him this because I didn't want him to think less of me as a man or a young boy. So when I turned 16, he took me deer hunting with him. And I had a deer in sight, and I was just begging for this deer to run away. Cause I didn't want to shoot it. But he was like, go ahead, go ahead, do it, do it. So I did it, and I shot him. And I pretended I was happy and manly for my father. Then I cried for, like, months. Hmm. I cried like you wouldn't believe. Hmm. He died suddenly at the age of 45, a year later. And hmm. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little choked up just thinking. No, no, it's an interesting story. It's a unique story. I tried to go hunting alone. And I had a buck in sight. And I, I couldn't do it. I just could not do it. I fired a warning shot in the air. And he took off. So what do you think the moral of the story is for the listeners, John? The more, the more the moral of the story, Dr. Savage, is you can't pretend to be somebody you're not. If you, either you're a hunter or are not a hunter. You can't pretend mm. to kill an animal, or you can't pretend to be like a tough guy, or, you know, you just can't. you got to be who you are, no matter who you're going to disappoint. Amen to that. God bless you for saying that. You are absolutely right. Five bells in the Savage Nation. John, I'm sending you God, faith, and reason. What a beautiful call that was to all the children out there. Don't be mean just to prove you can be mean. That doesn't mean be a, a sucker and a pushover either. You see, this is the hard thing for a kid to learn. How does a boy in particular in this society not go all the way to the other side? Huh? This is the real, this is the real challenge. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. All right, we, we can move past the um, animal thing and the difference between thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder. I can do the news of the day. What is the news of the day? Let's see. What did I miss? What, another sex accusation somewhere? Wait. Let me turn. Ah. Let's see. Uh, in or out. Or the, what's that guy? I forget the comedian with the finger. What's his name? I forget his name already. That, that Trump attack. Who? Oh, yeah, Al Franken. He's so important. Real important. He's a senator like, like a fly as a senator. That election was stolen. We know that. A couple of hundred votes, the Democrats stole that seat. Look what he's done to it. All right, maybe they'll throw him out, and you'll think that's good, but they'll replace him with someone even wackier than him. You know, there's breaking news out of New York. Massive fire rages on the roof of Manhattan building. That means I'm probably preempted in New York City. <laughs> I don't know. A fire broke. Is anyone listening in New York? Am I still on the air? Is there anybody still on in WABC? No, it's not funny. Fire rages on top floor of Harlem apartment building. We'll have to watch that one. Here's an odd story. There's a black lady who was a diversity chief at Apple. Nice lady. She was fired. You know why? Yeah, she was a diversity chief, and she was African-American. They fired her. She said that being a minority or a woman are not the only criteria for diversity. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine she actually said there can be 12 white, blue-eyed, blonde men in a room, and they're going to be diverse, too? because they're going to bring a different life experience and life perspective to the conversation? Well, they fired her. She said diversity is the human experience, 
I get a little bit frustrated when diversity or the term diversity is tagged to the people of color or the women or the LGBT. This woman is a brilliant woman, and I hope that Donald Trump hires her immediately and puts her on a federal level. This is a great woman. And they fired her at Apple. It shows you. Tim Cook, you should be ashamed of yourself. So they threw her out of the company. They're going to put someone in who's more inclusive. You know, there's someone who's more inclusive is someone who's exclusive, who doesn't let white males in. That, that's their idea of inclusion, is to attack white males. That's their idea of inclusion, is attack whitey. Harvey Weinstein's first and second wives are expected to fight over his fortune. Well, that much he made. I compare myself to everybody. I can't help it. I want to see if I'm worth more than him. Because we grew up in a similar neighborhood. He went, by the way, of pornography and violence, and I didn't. I went the other way. I can't listen on the air. How much is he worth? I wonder if he did better than me. <laughs> do you ever do that? Are you competition with other people in your life? Like you read, <laughs> you always read about someone else. What a face he has. This guy has a face for what he was accused of. What a brutish looking. How do you get that good looking model, I wonder, as a wife? That's it. It looks like a beard to me. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Whatever. How much do you think he's worth? Look, at Owen. Look up celebrity net worth. They're wrong anyway. They're wrong about me. They're wrong about everybody. They don't really know. They guess. Can anyone do a quick search on Harvey Weinstein's net worth? Harvey Weinstein and his current wife, Georgina Chapman. Battle of the exes in divorce court. Oh, God, lawyers. Oh. So now we've got to watch this. Harvey Weinstein did this. Harvey Weinstein did that. Franken did this. Franken groped. Frank did, didn't grope. Benjamin Franklin groped. The next we're going to hear about Benjamin Franklin after Franklin. Benjamin Franklin was a big div. You know that. If you read his letters from Paris, you, you know anything about Franklin? They're, Benjamin Franklin, they're liable to disinter him from the grave and uh, hold a trial, a mock trial. Maxine Waters could try him and say impeach, impeach, impeach. And then they could burn his corpse if there's anything left. Well, the bones. They could powder the corpse outside the Capitol Hill building. And she could scream about uh, impeach. Rape survivor dumps Franklin as sponsor of her bill to help victims of sex assault. Trump's approval rating hits a new low. Oh, God, what's this now? Where's this? Came back from the trip. Wait a minute, I thought it went up. <clears throat> the Hill reported only 41% of registered voters surveyed approved the job the men she was doing, while 59% of those surveyed disapproved. The Harvard-Harris survey, please. Harvard? Anything with Harvard in it is what Harvard has become. Harvard-Harris. All right, whatever. Who knows what it means? I could go into that, but I'm not going to. The tax cut's going to be the final straw for everybody. We're all getting screwed. Anyone who makes a living in this country is getting hammered by the new tax proposal. And I got to say this to the Republicans. You had a supermajority and you blew it. And I'll, I'll make a prediction. If they, don't re if they don't reverse course, which I think they cannot or will not do, the country will be ruled by Democrats for the next 60 years. As bad as they are, I'm telling you what's going to happen. People who went from the independent side to try Trump, if they can't even give us tax reform and they won't give us any relief whatsoever, those of us who kill ourselves by working to support the deadbeats and the bums and the grifters, forget about it. You know, I've been thinking about this. The only way I can avoid paying such high state taxes in California, which is like 15%, on top of the 40% that I'm paying the criminal federal government for nothing, Think about it. I pay 55% of my income to the bums, the criminals, the criminal gang. I'm so angry at it. So I say, well, why am I working so hard? Writing books, doing a daily show. If I don't work, I'm going to pay no taxes on my income. I mean, I'll have residuals on my books, I suppose, but it won't be anywhere near what I'm earning now. It would give me a satisfaction to live on Social Security and take something. I've been working since I'm five years old. I look at it. You won't believe it. I've been putting it into the Social Security system since I'm 16. And I've been working since I'm five. I said, I don't want to do this anymore if they're going to rob me. So I thought when Trump came along, I'd get a, a break from 40%. It would drop down to like 25. And then I'd spend the money and the, the people would benefit from what I'm buying, right? No, wrong. We got worse off with them. Worse. How could it be they got worse? Let me explain something. If Hillary had won, she never would have gotten away with raising the taxes on the middle class and the rich the way Trump is. Do you understand what I just said to you? Because then the Republicans, oh, look what she's doing. She's a communist. 
She's a Marxist. She wants to kill them in the productive class. Well, when they're doing it, though, it's okay. That's the end of the road. Between the elephants and the taxes, the elephant is, is sent a shot. That's a good one. Between the elephants and the tax cuts that weren't, the elephant is now sent a shot and going down. Russia is planning to colonize and mine the moon. That's my problem. I'm not, I'm not going to sleep tonight laying in bed and thinking about Putin on the moon. Planning to colonize and mine. The, oh, wait till the mining of the moon starts in. What are they going to bring back? We can't go to the moon. Obama took away NASA so we can't go to the moon. As part of this drive, the Luna 25, formerly known as Luna Glob. I used to eat in a restaurant called Luna on 2nd Avenue and 17th Street. It was good food. It went out of business, I heard, in the 80s. Heavy Sicilian hot food. By the way, I want to talk about food. I got distracted for a minute. You know the difference between hot Italian food and hot Mexican food is like a, a, a different world of spices. Did you know that? And Italian food today has been, well, because all the cooks are from Mexico or that area. It's not really Italian food anymore. They like hot and spicy food south of the border, but that's not the spices that were used by Italians. They didn't use a lot of red pepper. Just a little note. The Soviet lunar mission was set in 1976 when the Luna 24, Luna, Luna, I think of La Luna in Mulberry Street when I see, oh, that's why I'm, I'm tripping on that, La Luna. I remember I used to go there on Mulberry Street. It's still there, I heard. Gangsters used to run in the front door and out the back door. I loved it. It was in a movie years later. After, after committing a crime, they'd run in the front door and out through the kitchen. No one dared look at them. They did. Your head would go into the sauce. What are they going to actually get on the moon? I, what can they get off the moon? There must be something up there that Russia's going to get. Why can't we do it? You know what someone told me the other day? Does anyone know if this is true? I want the article. Do you know that Israel, the U.S. now has a military base for the first time in history in Israel? Did you know that? I, someone said it to me the other night. They said, what? Robert, research that quickly. Google it. American military base in Israel. I said, What? That got built and no one knew about it. No, and that means big stuff is coming. Be between the king abdicating in Saudi Arabia and putting in the prince and getting rid of all of the other princes and princelings in Saudi Arabia who were not really vehemently on our side, but they were on the Iranian side. He, they purged them. They're gone. They're, you think they're going to get a fair trial? Oh, no, no, no. Think of hands flying and heads flying. Never mind how rich they were. They'll take their money and cut their heads off. So now we have an alliance with Saudi Arabia, with Israel, against Iran. There's a war brewing, a big one. Oh, play that song for me, Black Moon Rising. That's what I want to hear. The phone number is 855 Don't talk to me about killing elephants now. I can't take it anymore. I, I'm, it's not like I'm over it, but I'm not doing it right now. There's more humanity in an elephant than there is in the average Republican that I have found. The, the Democrats don't even count. All they're interested in is sex and corruption. They don't even know what an elephant is. They went to a zoo when they were six. That's the last time Harvey Weinstein's type saw an elephant. Animal crackers, they know an elephant. They never even went to the zoo. After the, the Seltzer, where there was nothing left, so they had animal crackers. Do you have Black Moon Rising or whatever? Bad Moon Rising? What is it? Play it for me. Bad Moon Rising. That's the one. Yeah, here's one of the most, one of my favorite people, Gloria Alred. I think God created Gloria Alred to remind me how much I love, why I love lawyers so much. I just love her because she reminds me of everything I love about the legal profession. She was asked on, of all places, MSNBC, whether her client, Beverly Young Nelson, right, if she actually saw Roy Moore sign her yearbook. This is a huge story. I want you to listen to clip one. I'm sorry, clip four. As she is challenged on this fraudulent discard, I've never seen anything like this. In a sane society, this woman would not be practicing law. Do you know how many lives have been ruined by accusations that are not valid? Listen cl carefully to 04. She remembers being with him. It was on the counter. Uh, she alleges that he took it, that he signed it, and she was thrilled that he had signed it because, as far as she knew, he was a DA, and that was an important position. So she saw I don't him think sign at it. the time she had a clue whether he was an assistant DA or a DA, but he signed uh -huh. it, she took it, 
uh, as far as she knows, um, mm -hmm. I mean, there's no reason for her to think it's anybody, anything but his signature. But did she see him uh -huh. sign it? Uh, you know, I don't, I, mm. I, I haven't asked her if she saw him, but we did describe what happened that oh, you evening did, in Gloria, question. Huh? Uh -huh. uh, that what she alleges was that she put it on the counter, uh, that I think that he asked to sign, or that he did mm -hmm. sign it. That's oh, all. Yeah. Um, I ask this because it seems like you're not 100% sure that it is yeah. his signature. And if you're Good not 100% you. sure that it is his signature, why would you show it at a press conference? Oh. Well, why would, you know, why does anybody doubt that it is his signature? You know, the Bible wrote about Gloria Alred and her daughter in many places. We actually were warned about Gloria Alred and her daughter in many places in the Bible. She is destroying a man's life based upon what she says is true, not upon the evidence, nor an attempt to examine the evidence. And here is a man, who, a man whose life has been destroyed because of a lawyer who has tried him and convicted him in the court of public opinion. And frankly, MSNBC did a better job than Fox News did on grilling her. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. Look, if you own a car... You own a car, listen carefully, because sooner or later your car is going to break down. It's a fact every car, truck, and SUV, know, SUV owner knows. And if you're lucky, it'll happen while you're on the warranty. But what happens if it breaks down after the warranty expires? Thousands of dollars. That's why I tell you to get coverage from carshield.com. Skip the hassle of paying thousands of dollars for a tranny or even a sensor, right? Go to carshield.com because you can go to the dealership to do the work, get your own mechanic, no checks in the mail. No waiting for reimbursement. Car Shields administrators even give you the VIP treatment. They'll give you 24-7 roadside assistance, even a rental car, while yours in the shop. If your car is 3 to 12 years old, doesn't mean you have to pay high repair bills. Listen carefully. Car Shield administrators have paid out close to $2 billion in claims. They're the real McCoy. Save yourself thousands in potential car repairs. Get covered by the ultimate and extended vehicle service protection before it is too late. All you got to do is call 800 car 6100 mention savage or visit carshield.com code savage and we're going to give you 10% off that's carshield.com savage a deductible may apply Well we've been talking about saving the elephants and the lions from the human turds called big game hunters we've been appealing to the president of the United States to reverse the reversal of um, bringing in the heads of uh, elephants Hippos, lions, uh, so far we haven't gotten a call from the White House. Would have been nice if Donald Trump had been... Oh, let's call the Savage Nation. Michael, this is Donald. How are you? Been busy, haven't been able to say hello. Uh, we've heard you, Michael, and um, it really touched my heart. So with this phone call, I'm going to announce that we're going to reverse the reversal and the elephants... The lions and the rhinos, we cannot, we, they will not be imported into America. It's all because of you, Michael Savage. And as a result, we're going to give you a, a special prize. You'll be named the commander of the order of the British Empire. And at the same time, Michael, I'm going to nominate you for the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Well, thank you, Donald Trump. I appreciate that very much. Well, none of that happened. But luckily, I have a fertile imagination. And we, know, we don't know how things uh, will work out at the end of the day. Commander of the Order of the British Empire was given to Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> to show you what a war's are worth. In 2004, Harvey Weinstein was named the Commander of the Order of the British Empire. <laughs> oh, the British Empire. Dun, 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 dun. Let's see. Weinstein has been criticized by some for the techniques he allegedly applied in his business dealings. Deeds as campaigning for Oscars. Blah, blah, blah. Reputation for ruthlessness and fits of anger. Blah, blah, blah. Put a New York Observer reporter in a headlock to him out of a party. Blah, blah, blah. Weinstein publicly criticized director Julie Timmer and husband during a... Blah, blah, accused of hassling Sidney Pollock on his deathbed about the release of the film The Reader. Blah, blah, blah. It's all in there under his, his net worth. Pretty high. $300 million. A lot of money. My guess is after this is all over, he'll be wearing a barrel uh, with suspenders on it. 
after the wives and the and the accusers get through with them. Gloria, are you listening? Three hundred million dollars, Gloria. You and your daughter are fire up the jet. See if you can sign someone up, Gloria. Go ahead. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. Warning. The Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. I knew the world was evil ever since I've been a little child, but I never knew it got as evil as it has gotten today. Now you say, what am I talking about? Oh, I don't care about Franken. That's not what I'm talking about. I don't care that the latest accusation is about emotional terrorism. You know, this nation is sophomore. I, to call this nation sophomoric would be too sophisticated to describe the level of intellect in this nation. No, we're not sophomoric. We're something below sophomoric. We're obsessed with sexual crap like this while the torture, the enslavement, the rape, of people is going on around the world mainly in Muslim countries and the slaughter of beautiful animals like elephants lions rhinoceros goes on in the name of compassion for uh, the animal mister president you just plain wrong I woke up yesterday I saw the Trump administration reverses the ban on the import of elephant trophies now if you look at this you say well that's a good thing why is it a good thing it's not a good thing no, it's not a good thing at all. For those of you who want to justify the hunting and killing of poor endangered animals who have no chance whatsoever with the tracking devices that you use, with the high-powered rifles that you use, with the local indigenous uh, hunters that you use, these elephants don't stand a chance. You're just a bunch of psychopathic murderers. And for you to say that you're doing the world and the elephants and the lions a humane service sounds very similar to me what the Nazis said they were engaging in the compassionate killing of the disabled. You're not helping anyone. You are all psychopaths, and you're cowards on top of it all. The only thing I can remind you of is this. Ernest Hemingway, a great American writer, was a big game hunter. In the end, he shot his own brains out with a shotgun. That's because his whole life he was probably on the verge of suicide because of his internal demons. And so he took it out on poor, helpless animals in Africa. You better pray that you're not going to end up like Ernest Hemingway with your own head on a wall. It gets worse. There are big game farms here in America, in Texas in particular. You can show pictures of it if you'd like to see it. Go to michaelsavage.com. You want to get sick today? Go ahead. Make my day and get sick. You will see lions in a large corral waiting to be hunted by cowardly men who come there and pay a fee just to shoot them. They're raised to be killed like a sheep. What do you say about a thing like this? How can you still back a Trump administration that would reverse a ban on the importation of elephant trophies? How? Is there no point at which you will finally say enough is enough? So I wonder, what did Trump trade? What did Trump trade in China to let this happen? Because most of the uh, ivory goes to China. You see, there's such an advanced civilization in China that they need to show ivory on their uh, mantles. They're just such an advanced civilization. I love all of the liberal Americans who somehow think that all countries on Earth are more sophisticated than we are. But in China, you see, they love to show the ivory to show how rich they are. I understand some trade deals were done with China. I suppose one of the trade-offs was, go ahead. You can import the ivory, and we'll let the cowardly, impotent men who hunt these animals, uh, who have no chance whatsoever, go and kill them. Everyone will make money, and it's all about money. That's all that matters, the almighty dollar. One hunter who refused to be named is seen shooting a crocodile. It should be an easy target, but the hunter cannot manage a clean kill. It is dragged to the bank and waits for death. 
The hunter then shouts, let me put my beer down, before firing a bullet into its brain at close range. Oh, yeah, MF, he cries. I'm done for today. It's party time, boys. The hunter still wants to kill a warthog, a baboon, and a bush pig before he leaves and finds time to share a creepy kiss with his uh, girlfriend while posing beside a dead wildebeest. It is all legal with 150 farms in South Africa holding permits to breed lions for trophy hunting. Breed lions for trophy hunting. Breed lions for trophy hunting. That allows hunters to select the gender, size, and color of their animal, as well as species. So that's it. That's the whole story. Uh, I, I remain speechless on this. I mean, I, I won't say another word on it. You understand what I'm saying to you? What more can I do? This show is heard on almost 300 radio stations. I have a huge streaming presence. It was number one as a streaming show in the country. It's now one or two. It doesn't much matter what it is. The numbers are pretty high. I didn't even know they were this high until just I just got an email about 30 minutes ago. I think I can disclose this to you. I have over 3 million people last month, 3 million people listening to my show on demand in the last month. I realize it's not that big. That's <laughs> pretty big by comparison in some ways, isn't it? So a lot of people listen to the show and get direction from the show. And I'm, I'm appealing to all of you to appeal to President Trump to reverse the reversal on this killing of animals in Africa. That's all I'm saying. Make it simple. And I have written an article that is respectful, Mr. President. It is entitled, Mr. President, You're Just Plain Wrong. And I want him to reverse this. Whoever ever lobbied for this must be overturned. I will appeal to the president to reverse the ban on the importation of elephant trophies. This is sickening. It's a sickening, heartbreaking story. And I have told you over and over again, the worst thing that so-called Republicans or so-called conservatives can do, the worst thing they can do, is fulfill the stereotype that the left has of them. By reversing the ban on the importation of elephant trophies, the Trump administration is confirming the worst image imaginable of so-called conservatives. They hate animals, they destroy the earth, etc. You get the etc. You get the picture? Donald Trump may not even know this was done. I don't know when this was done. But I know that this Obama-era ban on hunters importing trophies of elephants killed in Zambia and Zimbabwe was overturned. My friends, we cannot per permit this. This is a venal pay-to-play. Wayne Passell, president and chief executive of the Humane Society, told the Washington Post, he said, it is, it is a venal and nefarious pay-to-slay arrangement that Zimbabwe has set up with the trophy hunting industry. Now, Zimbabwe is a criminal gangster state run by Mugabe, a mass murderer. In addition to murdering his own people and stealing the land from the farmers when he took it over, used to be called Rhodesia, he said he would help the blacks of Zimbabwe. Need I remind you what happened? When whites were farmers in Zimbabwe, they were exporting food to the world. When Mugabe, the mass murderer, took over Zimbabwe, ex Rhodesia, and turned the land over to his native peoples, what happened? They couldn't farm the land properly. They became a basket case, and they've been begging for food on the world stage ever since. So now that they've destroyed themselves, they want to destroy their, their elephants. What kind of message does it send Donald Trump to the world that you would reverse a thing like this? I have given time and money to the elephant projects for years. And to me, this is far more important than groping, to be honest with you. This is sickening. It turns my stomach. And remember what I'm saying to you, Mr. President. It's in your hands. You have the power to reverse this. You can send a lesson to those working for you that you will not tolerate the destruction and the killing of innocent animals. Remember what I said to you, Mr. President. You have the power. This does not justify the hunting and killing of them. Remember, Mr. President, we are the elephant. I am the elephant. You are the elephant. 
And when we lose our compassion for the world's most noble creatures, who is next? Will we start culling the human herd, saying there's overpopulation as well? Many believe we are doing that just now. We are desensitizing ourselves to the taking of life, whether it's through the abortion of the unborn in this country or the mass killing of beautiful animals in Asia and Africa. See, Mr. President, insensitivity leads to brutality. We need to get back to a respect for life. And this lesson of respect for life, Mr. President, goes all the way back to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis. I wrote about it in a chapter entitled Dominion Over Animals. If you bought the book, God, Faith, and Reason, I invite you to go to that chapter and read what I tell you dominion over animals actually means. It doesn't mean kill the elephants and bring their ivory to China. Trust me, the Bible doesn't mean go and destroy the earth. It doesn't mean sack the earth. It doesn't mean kill the elephants. It doesn't mean kill the rhinos. It does not mean destroy everything because you're a man. And so I am not alone on this. I know that many of you agree with me. And although we have dominion over many things that we don't necessarily consume to the point of destroying them, listen to me. There comes a time in human evolution when we must evolve in our observations about not only ourselves or the earth or the cosmos, but about animals too. They're not all there for our pleasure or just to kill and eat them. That's not what having dominion means. Even Republicans have to grow up. You know what conservation is? It's the opposite of environmentalism. Conservation is a core conservative political principle that modern conservatives should reclaim. Well, I have news for you. It's a core spiritual concept as well, which is directly related to the passage in Genesis about having dominion over the earth and its living inhabitants. That's all in, yeah, it's in God, faith, and reason. What do you want me to do, hide it? Just because I was ahead of the curve on all these stories, I should hide it now. I should be ashamed of what I wrote. I should be ashamed, ashamed of my insights. No, I will not be. What is worse than killing elephants? Tell me. Is groping a woman worse than killing elephants? Or is groping women worse than killing elephants? That's an interesting moral question. No man is an island, let me tell you that. For whom the bell tolls, my friends... That's what we're talking about now. You know, it's almost applicable to what we're seeing now. You think about that one. For Whom the Bell Tolls, a great poem, which almost approaches a religious piece by the great dead white male poet John Donne. Do you know it? He was writing something called Devotions Upon Emergence Occasions, and he said, No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. What he meant was that although we're individuals, we're also part of a whole which makes living as individuals possible. And he was saying that the death of any one person diminishes the life of every other because it diminishes the whole. And that's why his famous poem, poem ends as follows, Never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Now this is no longer taught by the polyps in the U.S. academic establishment. The polyps who have turned academia into a cauldron of left-wing hatred for everything Caucasian, everything European, everything that is great on this earth, created by whites, but now expunged by the polyps who have taken over every aspect of the academy. But what does that have to do with today, No Man is an Island? Killing the elephant is killing the man. Killing an innocent great creature like an elephant is so heartbreaking, it's unbelievable. And Donald Trump simply has to override the turnaround of this law passed under Obama. Not everything Obama did was bad, and not everything Trump does is good. Do I have to make it that simplistic for you? If you cannot judge things by things and, and pieces by pieces and legislation by legislation, then you can't judge anything. And I am telling you that overturning this law is so sickening. It is so heartbreaking to believe that in this day and age, the Trump administration would permit the reversal of the ban on the importation of elephant trophies. And, and most of the ivory goes to China, by the way. You talk about that. Oh, boy. It is so venal to do a thing like this. And Trump has the power to overturn it. I know by saying this, the next ice cream summit is off. There goes the Hanukkah party. There goes the Thanksgiving, the turkey leg at Mar-a-Lago. There goes the New Year's. Uh, uh, eggnog, it's all gone, went up in smoke. But I am an independent-minded man. 
And I think that's why Mr. President doesn't come on the show. I thought about it in great detail. I hear he likes me, tells everyone how much he likes me. Because I probably remind them of the people he grew up with who were straight shooters, straight talkers. They told them what they thought. But they're all afraid, the handlers, that if he came on this show, they can't predict where I would go. So, you know, free thinkers are dangerous to all power structures. Be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. I am convinced that the president doesn't even know this happened. I am convinced that the stereotype of the ugly Republican on steroids is not even something they're aware of in the White House. But everything the left says about the insensitive, earth-destroying, animal-destroying, oafish Republican is coming to fruition all in one, one move. Mr. Trump, who advised you on this? You still have time to reverse this order and restore common decency. Not everything that Obama did was wrong. This is something that Obama did that was right. Mr. Trump, stop the importation of elephant trophies, lion trophies, and stop it now. I will tell you right now, Mr. Trump, if you do not do this, you will be not only a one-term president, you'll be gone before the end of the term because you will lose the entire independent vote. You'll lose all the women. You'll lose the independent animal-loving voter. You see, these restrictions were created in 2014 because the African elephant population had dropped. The animals are still listed in the U.S. Endangered Species Act, which requires the U.S. government to protect endangered species in other countries. We now have in certain regions of Africa an overpopulation of elephants because of conservation efforts. That's a good thing. But this does not justify the hunting and killing of them. Remember Donald Trump? We are the elephant. I am the elephant. You are the elephant. And when we lose our compassion for the world's most noble creature, who will be next? Will we start culling the human herd, saying there's overpopulation as well? Becoming so insensitive to life itself? Well, many believe we're doing that just now by killing the unborn. We are desensitizing ourselves to the taking of life. And Mr. Trump, insensitivity leads to brutality. We need to get back to a respect for life. Mr. President, you're just plain wrong on this. The lesson that I'm trying to teach you today, all of you who are listening, and there are millions of you, believe me, the lesson of respect for life goes back all the way to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis. I write about it in a chapter called Dominion, in God, Faith, and Reason. But dominion over all things on earth does not mean hunting and killing innocent animals. It does not mean that at all. Dominion means conservation. It means conserving them. It means protecting them. Savage. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. To the Savage Nation, I want to move on from the killing of the big game and how Trump should not reverse the Obama order on this to uh, how sensitive do you want to be? I wrote about it in one page in God, Faith, and Reason. I think it's worth buying the book just for the two pages on dominion and sensitivity. And I'm going to read you one page from God, Faith, and Reason because I do want you to buy the book before Sunday. How sensitive do you want to be? There's a trend in America and the West now where people are overly sensitive to the living things around them. We all know about vegan diets. People think it's healthier. Now, this is not a book about nutrition, so I won't get into that. But I do want to talk about people becoming so sensitive to animal life that they refuse to eat animals or animal products. I understand that. It would be hard to find many people who would not become vegetarians or vegans after visiting a slaughterhouse or watching a film of what happens inside a slaughterhouse, seeing the fear in the animals' eyes and hearing their cries as they're killed. I understand the sympathy people have for them. But there are also people who say that they can hear the trees crying in a newly built home or a newly built cabin. Did you know that? I remember reading about this in a story by a rabbi of the Orthodox Jewish tradition, Chabad, written sometime in the 17th century in Russia or Poland. One of the sages wrote, wrote that when he went into a newly built cabin, he could hear the trees the cabin was made of crying. There's another story about the son of one of the great sages that took a leaf of a tree as he was walking in the forest with his father. And the father admonished the boy by saying, how can you be so insensitive to ruin something that is so alive for no reason whatsoever? So how sensitive do you want to be is the question. How tuned in do you want to be to the voices that travel around the world that no one can hear except the very few, the mad and the enlightened. And what are the voices that we're talking about? They can be anything. 
They can be the voices of people crying out as they die. They can be the voices of spirits, things of that nature. How sensitive do you want to be is always the question. In my own life, I do not think it's that important to tune in to such an extent that you lose the scope of the world in which we are living. The here and now, the world where our feet are planted on the ground. This earth is the only heaven for so many billions of people, and we must learn to live in this heaven God has created. Sure, there may be an afterlife, but we don't know that for sure. The only world we have direct knowledge of is this world, which we must not mess up. So how sensitive you want to be becomes not so much a question as a statement. Being insensitive makes you oafish, but being overly sensitive can render you incapable of living on this earth. And that's my revelation for the day. You can read it for yourself in God, faith, and reason. Share it with others. And that brings us to something I want to talk about, which is the difference between killing and murdering. Because there's a great confusion in those of you who are listening to me, where you may think I'm a pacifist. You're wrong. I'm not a pacifist. I'm a man who hates violence and who would rather avoid confrontation if I could and avoid war. But don't confuse me with a pacifist. There's a fabulous article on this by Rabbi David Bendori, director of a group called Jews for the Preservation of Firearms Ownership. It's a fabulous article, and I'm going to quote a little bit from it, where he says, The Ten Commandments, Killing and Murder, a detailed commentary. Jews for the Preservation of Firearms Ownership. And he says, This is a detailed commentary intended to give valuable reference to Jews and Christians who find themselves facing unfounded pacifist dogma. So let's begin, and I'm going to paraphrase and, tra and, and actually quote. One of the most commonly mistranslated verses of all the Hebrew scriptures, which has resulted in deadly misinterpretation, according to the rabbi, is where the Torah, Exodus 20, says, Lo tizach, the Hebrew word used as a clear meaning, do not murder. It doesn't mean do not kill. I learned this a long time ago because I was, conf I was confronting a holy writer on this. Where it says, if thou, thou shalt not kill, how can you then go to war against those who want to slay you? Because there's a big difference between thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not murder. Unfortunately, many of us have mistranslated the Bible as meaning do not kill. But he says the Hebrew could not be more clear, and there is a world of difference between killing and murder. How many times have you heard, thou shalt not kill? It's a mistranslation. It's etched into the hearts and minds of both Jewish and Christian children and, and adults with pernicious results, says the rabbi. And he asks, can we possibly estimate the numbers of lives that have been lost by foolish pacifism rather than righteous defense in the face of evil? You can read the article yourself, and he goes into killing and murdering. And we're going to talk about that maybe another time. And I don't want to give you what he wrote. You can read it for yourself. The point is, is that... If you're out to defend yourself, you're not murdering anybody. You're killing somebody, right? What's the difference between killing and murdering? What if a driver accidentally hits a jaywalking pedestrian? That's a little different. What about a soldier who kills an enemy in battle? What about a drug dealer who kills his competition? What about a doctor who kills his patient? Well, I'll let you think about that. In order for you to understand the biblical words for killing, you have to first understand a grammatical point. Hebrew words all contain three-letter roots that provide the core meaning of a word. And these three consonants are then vocalized by adding in vowels and attaching prefixes, suffixes, or infixes. You can read more about it on the rabbi's page, which I'll link up on michaelsavage.com. The point is, don't fall into the pacifist trap, because it's a big difference. Thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not murder. We talked about the difference between faith and belief. I know it sounds boring, but it isn't. It's very important. Maybe it isn't to you now. But what if your marriage is on the rocks? What if you're broke and you lost everything? What if your child is sick with a very serious illness? So what are you going to do, pray? You think that if you pray and believe strongly enough, God is going to listen and cure your child, fix your marriage, make you rich? You really believe that? could be childish I think it is childish because I remember I had uh, been there many times in my life and no magic happened God didn't come down oh sure here's a here's some gold oh sure here have a position at the university 
No, sir. Here, you can have a cure to your headache. And so you start to say, is there a God? You don't know what to do. You had a belief in God, but did you have faith in God? That's the difference. Your mind had a belief in God, but did you have a soul that had a faith in God, where your spirit understood God was real, or did your mind interfere with your concept? What am I talking about? Unless you have been through this, you won't understand it. Unless you have called out to God at a time of need and have not been answered, you won't know what I'm talking about. Did you hear what I just said? Not been answered. The next time you have a spiritual crisis, my advice, don't expect too much to happen at that moment. Just understand what's happening to you will eventually pass. This too shall pass. That too shall pass. I tell a story in my book <clears throat> about Moses parting the Red Sea, whether it's fable or fact is irrelevant. The story is very important. The Jews are led out of the bondage of Egypt, according to the biblical story, and they can't cross the Red Sea because there's a sea. And Moses parts the Red Sea for whatever that means. The sea parts, Jews cross it, they enter the promised land, and then the sea returns. Well, is that the end of the story or the beginning of the story? It's the, it's the beginning of the story because when the Jews entered the promised land, they had a fight to achieve the promised land. It wasn't given to them. It wasn't waiting for them. It was not a land of milk and honey. And that's exactly what I'm trying to tell you with your own life. It's one thing to have the Red Sea parted for you with, uh, let us say, a break coming your way that you've been praying for or hoping for or wishing for. It's another thing to know what to deal with that, to, how to deal with that break, what to do with that break. How to cross the Red Sea is one thing, but you can't sit back on a recliner and have a, a beer for the rest of your life. Then you have to work. When I went through my crisis, one of them, many of them, I told you, because of the social cancer of a cancer of affirmative action, the social cancer that decided to target white males who were educated, intelligent, and able, and pushed them out of their desired professions. The social cancer destroyed many men. It did not destroy me. I'm very lucky. I found out that I'm tougher than that. I thought I would crack. I thought I'd break. I had two young children. I worked my guts out to get the union ticket. And then they said, drop dead, white man. We have to make room for people who are different than you. I said, what are you talking about? I'm an immigrant son. I remember being at Berkeley. I remember they had a seminar, National Science Foundation Fellowships for Women. I was a young PhD. They wouldn't give me one. I said, what is wrong with you? What do you mean women? How can you give fellowships only for women? Why don't you give it to someone who's done excellent work? They laughed at me, these creeps from the NSF. Boy, I wish Trump had made me the head of the NSF. I didn't ask for it, but I wish he did. I would have cleaned house like you can't believe. We'd have real science back in America instead of the stupidity that passes for science. But nevertheless, I didn't know what to do because the doors had all closed in my face. I did everything right. Doors closed in my face. Didn't know what I was going to do next. Well, I remember one night I went out on the deck and I was living in Fairfax, California in a little house on a hill. Alienated, isolated, cut off from reality. The people there were mean. A lot of potheads. Just, just awful place. Awful place. I mistook it for something country-like and beautiful and accepting it was just a town without pity and so i went out on the deck one night and i prayed i am talking i almost shook the mountains with my prayer i mean i have a good voice i must have shouted where the the, the valley resonated with my voice did the red sea part no no it did not part but somehow that prayer itself all i asked said to god was please give me a chance to prove my worth well, I don't know how it happened. I don't know when. And years later, I told you I sent out 450 or 500 demo tapes to radio stations across America. I bought a list of program directors, and five stations returned. I never thought it would happen. I recorded it, you know, in a studio in Sausalito, and I made a fake radio show for three, four minutes. I had friends call in like they were callers. I had to create that. 
I had to make up a show and send it out to 400 program directors. And five said, hey, you're really good. Would you like to try out on our station? Then I, I took an overnight job on KSFO. Then I was invited on uh, a full time. No, it was an overnight on KGO. Then I was uh, given a full time on KG KSFO. And the rest is history. Here I am almost a quarter of a century later. I, I can't believe I'm even telling you this story. But I have to fight every day. I'm in the promised land, am I not? Every day I have to fight to stay on the air. Do you know that or don't you know that? Do you know that we live and die by a single show? Did you know that? We live and die by a single word. Did you know that? We live and die by a single book. Did you know that? I mean, there are authors who are once well-known in this field who uh, are unknown right now. They can't sell a book. Their advances have gone down. No one will read them. They are like the silent movie stars who didn't know how to change with the times. They kept hacking the same garbage. The same story that was hot in 94 is dead now. You can't write a book on immigration, illegal immigration, expect anyone to buy it. Everyone's heard the story before. I can give you 10 topics that you shouldn't talk about on a radio because everyone's heard it before. Okay, the pulse of a dying frog on the side of a road is stronger than the listenership to those old stories that you're hearing. I'm telling you right now how it's going. And I made a decision. I made a decision to adapt or die because that's the way it is. But the point of the story is every day I am in the promised land only if I work in the promised land. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. All right, we, we can move past the um, animal thing and the difference between thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder. I can do the news of the day. What is the news of the day? Let's see. What did I miss? What, another sex accusation somewhere? Wait, let me turn. Ah, let's see. Uh, in or out. Or the, what's that guy? I forget the comedian with the finger. Al Franken, he's so important. Real important. He's a senator like, like a fly is a senator. That election was stolen. We know that. A couple of hundred votes. The Democrats stole that seat. Look what he's done to it. All right, maybe they'll throw him out. And you'll think that's good, but they'll replace him with someone even wackier than him. He has an odd story. There's a black lady who was a diversity chief at Apple. Nice lady. She was fired. You know why? Yeah, she was a diversity chief, and she was African-American. They fired her. She said that being a minority or a woman are not the only criteria for diversity. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine she actually said there can be 12 white, blue-eyed, blonde men in a room, and they're going to be diverse, too? because they're going to bring a different life experience and life perspective to the conversation? Well, they fired her. She said, diversity is the human experience. I get a little bit frustrated when diversity or the term diversity is tagged to the people of color or the women or the LGBT. This woman is a brilliant woman, and I hope that Donald Trump hires her immediately and puts her on a federal level. This is a great woman. And they fired her at Apple. It shows you. Tim Cook, you should be ashamed of yourself. So they threw her out of the company. They're going to put someone in who's more inclusive. You know, there's someone who's more inclusive is someone who's exclusive, who doesn't let white males in. That, that's their idea of inclusion, is to attack white males. That's their idea of inclusion, is attack whitey. Harvey Weinstein's first and second wives are expected to fight over his fortune. Well, how much he made. I compare myself to everybody. I can't help it. I want to see if I'm worth more than him. Because we grew up in a similar neighborhood. He went, by the way, of pornography and violence, and I didn't. I went the other way. I can't listen on the air. How much is he worth? I wonder if he did better than me. <laughs> do you ever do that? Are you competition with other people in your life? Like you read, <laughs> you always read about someone else. What a face he has. This guy has a face for what he was accused of. What a brutish looking. How do you get that good looking model, I wonder, as a wife? That's a, it looks like a beard to me. I don't know what that is. <laughs> How much do you think he's worth? They're wrong anyway. They're wrong about me. They're wrong about everybody. They don't really know. They guess. Can anyone do a quick search on Harvey Weinstein's net worth? Harvey Weinstein and his current wife, Georgina Chapman, battle of the exes in divorce court. Oh, God, lawyers. Ugh. So now we got to watch this. Harvey Weinstein did this. Harvey Weinstein did that. Franken did this. Franken grope. Franken didn't grope. Benjamin Franklin grope. The next we're going to hear about Benjamin Franklin. 
after Franklin. Benjamin Franklin was a big div. You know that. If you read his letters from Paris, you, you know anything about Franklin? They're, Benjamin Franklin, they're liable to disinter him from the grave and uh, hold a trial, a mock trial. Maxine Waters could try him and say impeach, impeach, impeach. And then they could burn his corpse if there's anything left. Well, the bones. They could powder the corpse outside the Capitol Hill building. And she could scream about uh, impeach. Savage. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel.